What's up, people? Welcome to our live stream. Today, we're going to be talking about the six worst mistakes when starting any art portfolio. And if you would like to learn how to turn your artistic weakness into your strength, check out artprop.org. We have lots of free resources, tutorials, critiques, pro development, workshops, and all that cool stuff. So, Clara, why don't you get us started on our first mistake? This is a big one. And if you make this mistake, you can end up wasting a huge amount of time and work, which is not understanding how the specific field works or even how the program you're applying to works. Because there's portfolios for all different types of things, teaching job, artist residency, MFA, illustration, animation job, artist grants. And Mia, I could have a nice portfolio, but I can't just send the same portfolio to everybody. Yeah, I think that it's the the saying of, um, I don't know, something of all master of none, that kind of saying where you really have to curate your portfolio to fit the exact job you're applying for. You can't have an illustration portfolio with a lot of fine art in it if you're going into the editorial field. You can't have um, a teaching portfolio for an MFA portfolio. And we're gonna talk more about that as we go along this stream. Jordan, I actually just learned five minutes ago <laughs> what these three sectors of animation are. And these are critical to understand if you want to create an animation portfolio, tell us what the difference is here and why the portfolios would be incredibly different from each other. Right. So the animation industry is built off of three separate segments. There's pre-production, um, and I'm gonna, and it's mostly for like TV animation. Pre-production is what we as Americans tend to do. That's the uh, the writing, the voice acting, the storyboards, character design, background design, prop design. All of those elements are pre-production main production is where the actual animation is done and usually that is shipped overseas for a show like family guy or simpsons or something like that it's usually shipped to a place like korea or um, some place in china or india and then once that's returned then you have post-production which is putting color and sound and music to everything uh, and so i think one of the biggest distinctions is you got to figure out which of those three categories you want to get into because it's all part of the animation industry Right. People will oftentimes say to me, oh, I want to make an illustration portfolio. But Mia, what's wrong with that? The illustration field is so broad. Um, there's children book por children's book portfolios. There's um, editorial portfolios. There's character de design portfolios. And each of those portfolios have so many different things. You're not going to include a double page children's book illustration in a graphic design based um, editorial portfolio. It's just you won't get hired because it's not what the um, employers are looking for. So it's important to be tuned in to what the field actually needs from you. Even with an editorial illustration, you can curate your portfolio to fit the publication. For example, there's all these political magazines. I'm not going to send them portraits of Broadway singers. That doesn't make a good fit, but I might send that to say Playbill. Customizing your portfolio is so important. And so people don't realize how much research and knowledge they have to acquire in order to just know what's required, not even making the artwork. Mistake number two, not having the correct info. Jordan, I know in our Discord, you have people asking a lot about the animation industry. How often do you talk to somebody who knows everything that is accurate about the industry? Uh, it's it's very rare, uh, unfortunately. And I think it, sometimes it's just hard to get access to the, the right information. And I know for students either coming just out of high school or just graduating from college, there's a lot of things that can be confusing because we've heard so many different things. And so you have, so once you hone in on what it is that you're trying to do, let's say you're trying to do character design, then you need to figure out exactly the right information for that segment. If you're going to do character designs, work on your turnarounds, work on expression, work on um, drawing in different styles. That's incredibly important to get a handle of. Jane makes a great point. 
It's like customizing a resume for different companies or positions. Never thought of it that way before. And that takes research. You have to look at Time Magazine. Okay, what types of illustrations do they make? I notice that their illustrations are very realistic looking. If you look at the New Yorker, they're actually very graphic, sometimes bright colors or more something that looks like it could be in a graphic novel. And Mia, I think people just don't understand the amount of research before you even pick up a pencil. Yeah, I mean, I also think that it shows your dedication to the potential position or job that you're going for is saying, I'm willing to put in this research and put in all this energy to make sure that you know and that you can see I can do this the way that you need it to be done. And that's a huge part of it. I think that people tell when you don't really know what you're applying for or you're rushing through the process. So yeah, it's entirely part of the process is to research and put the time in. If you don't, you're wasting not only your own time, but the person you're applying to is going to be frustrated because you're sending in a children's book portfolio for an editorial position. That's such a waste of time. And so, yes, it takes time to research, but it takes even more time to not research, which is absolutely critical. For example, I've noticed speaking to MFA, BFA candidates, there's so much incorrect information out there about degrees. Different types of teaching positions require different types of degrees. For example, if you want to teach college, you have to have an MFA. There's no way around that. But if you want to teach K to 12, you need to get certification so you can teach in a public school, get an MAT or a master's of education. But then it gets even more complicated because let's say you get K to 12, public school, you need certification. Private school, you don't need anything. I taught at a private school. I just had a BFA. And then college, you need an MFA. Mia, did you know all this stuff? No, it's so complicated. <laughs> and I feel like I only know it because you know it and you told it to me. <laughs> so I it, like it's so difficult to come across all of these very specific requirements or not requirements, but putting the time in really makes a difference. Um, as of right now, I'm not planning at teaching at a college or anything like that. But, you know, it helps a lot to know sort of the path, maybe the trajectory of what you're going for and preparing um, for that path. <laughs> I got to say, it's funny because I teach at a college and I didn't know what half of that stuff you just said. <laughs> Depends on the school, too. And also, if you want to teach adjunct, they don't care if you have an MFA. But if you want to be full time, you have to have an MFA. There's all these little <laughs> slight differences that you have to know about. And so Amanda's saying, so should we have different portfolios for different fields of interest? Jordan. Yes, uh, I think that's. I think it's really, really important to make sure that you're accurate in whatever you're applying for. So let's say, for example, I'm applying to a character design job at two different animation studios. One is in the style of SpongeBob and the other is in the style of a superhero like show. The Sometimes when they look at your portfolio, they will assume that you don't know how to draw any other way. So you have to make sure you tailor it very specifically. Like, some of you guys have seen my work and see that I do like really realistic stuff. I've actually been asked during job interviews, can you do really cute stuff? I was like, are you serious? Like, really? So, so yeah, you have to have different fun. Mia, Kat was telling me in my illustration portfolio, she said, you need to have illustrations with props because not everybody can do props. And I was like, well, can't they tell I can paint? Why does that matter that I have a prop <laughs> illustration? I think it shows variety. I think like Jordan was saying, you really have to, your portfolio should take the person by the hand and walk them step by step through exactly what you should like be able to do for the job and what you can do, because you're not gonna be sitting right next to the person being able to explain your portfolio to them. They need to be able to just take it and run with it and get as much as you wanna say out of it just on the work alone. So if you want them to know that you can draw more than just one thing, you have to include everything else that you can do because you're not gonna be there, you're not gonna be there to tell them. Actually, it's extremely common that a lot of studio artists don't realize that art history is 
worlds away from studio art, people will say to me, oh, I could do it on the side. I'm like, dude, you need a PhD for art history. You can't just take a few classes. Otherwise, you're not qualified to do anything. And art history is extremely academic. You are writing papers, books. You're being published in journals. It is not hands-on. Same thing with art conservation. People say, well, I could just get a job being a conservator. I'm like, no, you need a degree. <laughs> like, you have to have specialized training to do these things. And we have another question here from Amanda, who says, how much work should be in a portfolio? Jordan. Um, I think... I think usually 12 to 14 pieces is like the average of all the things I've heard. So it depends on the field, right? I'm sure there's some who prefer more and some prefer less, but that's kind of the average that I've heard from my field. It's tricky because my freelance illustration portfolio, I kept saying, I don't think I have enough pieces because I was imagining 20 and Kat was like, no, you could have eight. I'm like, that's it. <laughs> How about you, Mia? You're working on a children's book portfolio right now. Yeah, a children's book portfolio, character design portfolio, graphic novel portfolio. I have like 18 different portfolios um, and each of them took me months to do. And, you know, every I think that I stop when I feel like the person can get all they need to get out of it. So normally that's around like 12 to 15 pieces, um, some more, some less. But yeah, I try and just go until I feel comfortable. Amanda says, is there a difference between a professional fine art portfolio and an MFA portfolio? Yes, because professional fine art portfolio, you might be sending that to a gallery because you want a solo show. That work better be polished. An MFA portfolio, yes, you want to have a strong artistic vision, but it's not going to the gallery. That is a very different thing. Now, who can quantify what that is? You can't really do that, but it's more about the mindset you have to be in because if I'm preparing stuff for a degree, that's a different portfolio than, oh man, it's going into a gallery. I am going to sell this stuff in this hopefully very fancy, expensive gallery. <laughs> this is a big mistake too. Not getting trusted professional feedback. Now, Jordan, I know not everybody has access to that necessarily, but if you're watching this, you have access. <laughs> Jordan, why do a lot of people think they don't need this? Uh, honestly, I, I think some people just assume that they're good enough. Uh, oftentimes, I hear this story a lot, actually, especially when it comes to uh, art school and applying to art school, is these kids will say, I was the best artist in my school, in my whole high school of 30 people and you know, now I don't need to listen to anybody. And they get to art school and suddenly they're like, oh, the dynamics have shifted. I'm not as strong as uh, I thought I was. It's the same kind of thing with not getting professional feedback. You might think you're at a certain level, but with the professional giving you a look over your work, they could see a lot of things that you probably can't or are not even aware of. Well, Mia, you prepared your art school portfolio and because you had art prof connections. <laughs> Alex Rowe, who used to be a TA, he did a professional comprehensive portfolio critique for you. And can you imagine if you had never gotten that critique and did it totally by yourself? I would be nowhere. <laughs> um, that was so helpful. I remember I was in the car getting ready to go to SAT tutoring. Um, and I was watching that review and I was like, great, I'm bad at the SAT and I have to redo my portfolio. <laughs> And so, but you know, it's like more energy and more effort, but doing those changes and getting that feedback makes a world of difference because it shows that you're willing to put in the time and energy and all of that good stuff. So it's totally worth reaching out to someone who knows more than you and admitting that they do know more than you. That's what I did. <laughs> this is my freelance illustration portfolio as I put it together and I spoke to my former student, Alex Kiesling, who works professionally, has been very successful in the freelance illustration field. And I guess I was just in professor teaching slideshow mode. And I thought, oh, it's so clean. It's so easy to read. I've got my bullet points. And <laughs> I sent it to Alex. 
And he's like, no, <laughs> he gave me so much feedback. He was fantastic. And you can see, this is what I had. Okay. And this is Alex Kiesling. He was on a stream with us. You check it out. He's got a gold mine of information about illustration, but he said, no, let's do this instead. <laughs> Jordan, <laughs> I feel sort of embarrassed that my first impulse looks so crappy compared to what he did. <laughs> I think that's always it. Like, the, the thing about feedback is you have to be willing to, I want to say not take yourself so seriously, because that's not what I mean, but you have to be willing to kind of uh, get punched in the face a little bit with this, because it hurts. We've been working on our projects for so many hours, so many days, weeks, months, whatever, and then to have someone go like, nope, do it again. It, it's always, it always feels like your heart's being like quenched a little bit, but it's to make you better ultimately, especially if you find someone who's actually good at giving feedback because you got to watch out some people are not the best at giving feedback too <laughs> and the thing is i consider my, myself a professional i totally would have said this but i know how much alex knows about the field and i'm looking at this i'm like oh my god if i had said that i would have felt so humiliated so as you say mia it's more work number one to seek out the opinion number two to make those changes and i suspect maybe that's why people don't do it is because they're sort of afraid to be told they're doing it wrong or have to redo things oh yeah i mean something that i struggle with is trying to get it really polished and finished enough to send to the professionals to get feedback but then at that point i'm like well they're just going to tell me to change anything and i already did this much work and i don't know if it's worth it um but it always is it's just more energy and i'm tired all the time <laughs> <laughs> we love the honesty tell us, there tell us in the chat who here is working on a portfolio is thinking about a portfolio or maybe you have done one in the past maybe you could share some of your experience regarding getting feedback making changes because it's not fun to be told you got to do the whole thing over because i showed my portfolio to kat as well and that's when she told me about the props and then she said, Claire, you have some really good fine art portraits. You should put them in there. I'm like, yeah, but that's not illustration. And she's like, no, you're, you're trying to define illustration too narrowly. She explained to me in your portfolio, you're trying to show them, this is what I can do. Jordan, like you, showing them, yeah, I can draw a car. <laughs> I also think too, like it comes down sometimes to personal taste and subjective taste. So that's why some feedback hurts more than other feedback is where there are lots of professionals in the field, but every professional does their own thing and has their own avenue. And so, you know, listen and take in the advice, but if it really goes against the grain of what you're trying to do, you can trust yourself a little bit in that regard. Lisa says, Alex told you to make it look like a fancy graphic design publication. The bullets were perfect for the classroom back row. I needed Alex to shake it out of me because I really just had no idea what I was doing. Mistake number four, not finding out about formats and delivery. Look at all these options. Jordan, when you were setting out your animation portfolio, what format did you use to actually give them the portfolio? So usually it's just a form and it'll just say, insert your website and or your Instagram. That's it. I've, I've been in interviews, a number of interviews where they just go to my Instagram profile. Um, so it, they keep it really simple. Um, but I imagine there's plenty of other options out there for other jobs. And Mia, what are you doing for your children's book portfolio? How are you going to deliver it? Well, I've done all of these submission processes before. I've used all of them. I think that the one that I find the most effective is sending along a curated website. You can make a private website link and include it in your submission and you have free reign to not only upload a unlimited amount of images at quality that you like, but you can sort of design the page and use text and it's really fun and personal that way. So that's what I'm going with. But PDF is always like tried and true as well. It's funny because I was told in school, now granted, this is the 90s, <laughs> a long time ago, everybody said, oh, art directors really like PDFs. And I talked to Alex Kiesling and he's like, no, send a Google slideshow. I was like, oh, okay. And he actually sent me a sample Google slideshow, which helped me a lot. And if I hadn't asked him, I would have just thought, oh, 
I need to make a whole website gallery or I need to do all this stuff. And I was like, oh, Google Slideshow, I can do that. That's so easy. This is where you need that industry advice because Jordan, would you suspect some people feel like the animation portfolio has to be specially formatted? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, I think, again, we've probably heard so many different pieces of advice um, and opinions. So it's probably hard to tell. And, but one thing I, I will say, when it comes to applying to most jobs, usually they have a certain format that they that they'll tell you and a lot of it a lot of submitting a portfolio is just simply following directions and you'll be surprised how <laughs> bad some people are at following simple directions it might say put a pdf uh, download here put a you know website whatever and people just don't do it and they'll do all these outside pathways that don't really work so follow directions guys <laughs> <laughs> mistake number five pushing back on trusted advice. Now, let's assume you took the initiative, you went out and you got some professional opinion on what to do in your portfolio. It sort of amazes me that people will get that advice and then number one, question it, or number two, constantly ask why. Like, because, okay, we know like we're professionals for a reason. We're not just trying to mess with you. And this happens all the time. I mean, Mia, if I had a dollar for everybody who said this to me, my kids could go to college three times. Have you heard this? Oh, yeah. I, I've been chatting with people in the Discord about this topic, and I get it, right? I Anime is what made me want to learn to draw when I was five or whatever and it was so fun and I loved it and I got really good at it and I felt I felt like I couldn't really do anything else and I wanted to include it so badly but you know uh schools want variety and anime is sort of a one track sort of thing and so you have to open yourself up and I found when I tried to explore and finally gave in to the people being like just do something else I learned so much and I grew and now I'm making the things I'm making today. So it's worth it in the long run, no matter how frustrating it seems in the moment. And the thing is, we're not saying anime is terrible or, oh, master copies, that's not valid. We're not saying any of those things. We're saying for this very specific context, don't do it. And Jordan, to be honest, I just can't understand why people constantly argue about this when they get the advice they don't want to take it why do you think that happens i think it's just because what's that saying you can't see the forest from the trees um I, I think it's just basically that where you get this advice and it doesn't align with what you already believe in your head and so you will actively find ways to go against the advice that you're given uh and i will say that just like mia said earlier there are times where some some type of feedback is subjective and sometimes you could go against sure. the grain a little bit but i think you have to be at a certain place in your development as an artist for that um to be able to know when it's worth pushing or when it's worth listening to the feedback and in most cases for beginners it's worth just listening to the feedback and sticking with that especially when we've been praised for something for example let's say you did this painting and your high school art teacher gushed over it okay that's great and i think it's important to have that encouragement but mia you also have to accept the reality that you talk to somebody else who says uh-uh but then people say but but they liked it so much they liked it so how do you deal with that mia i think just like you said sort of placing your trust in um the professional in the field that you might want to go into or the professional um, portfolio reviewer for a BFA program that you really like or something like that. I think that um, it's worth listening and putting your trust into the person that's had success in that specific field and um, who might have some insider tricks and tips to give you along the way. This is my favorite one when people will say to me, well, couldn't I put in a sculptural illustration into a sculptural installation into my illustration portfolio, isn't that going to make me stand out? I'm like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> That's not going to happen. I mean, would you serve this big lasagna with tons of cheese to somebody who's lactose intolerant? I mean, just don't. All right. It's a matter of fit. See, Cantrell says, I agree with Kat. What you are selling is your point of view as well as skills. Here I am 
your individuality is what will make you stand out. But I couldn't see that. I was so blind to that suggestion. I'm so glad she told me. Jane says, we always talk about needing photography skills to photograph our art. This is really highlighting how true that is for a portfolio, not old school where you're carrying around a literal folder of work. Yeah, and Jordan, it takes some tech stuff to figure this out. Yeah, definitely. I mean, nowadays, if like a lot of times at conventions, they'll have portfolio reviews. I don't see a ton of people carrying these big old binders. They usually have it on the iPad or something, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so you have to go with whatever industry whatever the industry norm is that will automatically help make it seem more professional common time says quote so you're telling me i have to redo the whole thing you know the works i put in that portfolio took months are you sure it's worth which is why you guys can't wait to get feedback a lot of people say well i have to finish it first and then i'll get feedback and i say to people <laughs> it's too late to do that because I'm working with people on their portfolios already. It's not even September yet. And I'm already catching fundamental things that are either totally inaccurate or they're not doing the thing they're supposed to be doing. And so Mia, I feel like what we're really pushing is you guys have to know the arc of the process. A portfolio is not just one thing you stop in and then figure it out. Yeah, I think a lot of this just loops back to the first point, which is just knowing what you're doing and what to expect and what to prepare and doing that research because it's like building a castle on unstable ground, right? It's just going to collapse if you don't tend to the fundamental issues and the structural issues. So it's that's the most important thing. And it can lead to so much pain down the road if you do find out you have to redo the entire thing. That's horrible. And nobody wants that. It's just it's just sad. <laughs> all of these things we're telling you to all do, do it as early as you possibly can. Don't wait, because it's the work in progress critiques that are actually the most helpful because you can catch major fundamental problems. Mistake number six, thinking a portfolio will be easy and fast. What do you think, Jordan? So this this actually connects to the last thing you were talking about with portfolios and you know, the uh, Sandy Foundation and all that. Portfolios are not just a body of work. It's supposed to be a body of your best work, which means that it, it implies that you have more work that, that is out there somewhere and you just chose the top 10 or top 12 or whatever. So that process takes a while for you to develop the skill necessary to get to where you want to be in order to get the job or get to the school or whatever. It's not an easy process. You have to do a lot of uh, digging, a lot of self-reflection, maybe a lot of crying, but that's just part of the process. I just have found with any art endeavor, whatever amount of time that I think it's going to take, I always have to tack on at least another two hours. Yeah, I have never overestimated. I've never said to myself, oh, that'll take three hours. Wow, it only took two. Has that happened to you, Mia? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that especially if you're chasing a deadline, you'll find you'll take a lot of shortcuts and not be as thorough as you maybe should be. And then you'll look back at all your work and say, what? Why do none of these pieces look like my full potential? And it's because you need that time and energy and mental space to create as well. Putting yourself on a, on a tight deadline or waiting until the last minute, it's just going to make you stressed and the work is going to suffer because of it. Not easy, not fast. Amanda's asking, there's a lot more similarities with making a series of art and a portfolio. Now, a series is a different thing. There's some overlap, but between the two, I think the series assuming it's say going to a gallery or something, that's probably more work because you have the physical work portfolio, at least you can trim the edges and hide some of those little things in the digital images. And Helen says, I think you need to be careful about the reviews teachers give during class. They may be saying it's great based on your development throughout the class, but that may not mean it's portfolio ready. It's so great. The relationships we build with our teachers, but Jordan, there's a real value to talking to somebody who doesn't know you at all. Yeah, I think I, it's it's always really tough because when, when you're teaching someone, you want to be able to encourage them and say, hey, you have been improving, especially if they have been. But 
there's the other side where it's where you have to say, look, you're not industry ready. And it's never a fun thing to say. Like, I don't get joy out of saying something like that. <laughs> but but students and people who are learning do need to know the truth. And I think that's going to be the, the, the key to your artwork in the future, just knowing the truth about it. Is it actually good for what you're trying to do? Or does it need some extra work? And I think the number one most important skill any artist can have for themselves is being able to self-critique. So you have to know when you're ready. Yeah, and Mia, I do find that with a lot of people preparing portfolios, they're getting very scattered information. It's a little here, a little there. And so while we're saying it is good to get advice from somebody you don't know, if you have somebody who can watch the whole application process beginning to end, that is helpful. I know not everybody has that, but there is something you said about consistent support as opposed to one-off comments. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's someone cheering you on as well as giving you advice. It's someone yeah. saying, oh, we're so excited about your development. We're so excited about um, coaching you and helping you out and seeing the success because not only are you success, um, not only are you committed to your own success, but someone else is also committed to it. And that feels really good. It took me a minute to find the word. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, if you would like to have that experience, join our Art School Portfolios group. This is a seasonal group. It runs now through the end of March. And this is your opportunity to get mentorship that is ongoing from myself, from our staff of teaching artists. And it gives you the opportunity to get critiques. You have access to voice sessions and getting the right information. I've been running the group for a few weeks now, and already I'm correcting everybody on all of those mistakes in terms of the degrees, in terms of what's required. And to me, this is number one, the biggest bang for your buck out of everything we offer, but also getting to connect with other people in a space that's not competitive. I mean, Jordan, I always hate those, my accepted art school portfolio, it, it just sucks. Uh, isn't it nice to be with somebody and it's not about competition? Yeah, I mean, I know some people thrive on competition. I'm not one of those people. I don't enjoy that. I just rather everybody be chill. Let's all just improve together and have a, you know, Bob Ross kind of moment. You know, I like those better. Less pressure. I mean, I do do some butt kicking as well, but that's necessary for preparing an art school portfolio. We do have spots available in our September workshop, Selling Your Art, Underwater Creatures is this Saturday. You got to sign up now if you want to be in that one. Expressive figure drawing and food illustration. Please join us after this stream. Jordan and I will be in the post live stream stage session in our Discord. And if you're not in there, don't you want to hang out with cool kids? Because that's what I decided we are, because I was not cool in school. <laughs> join our Patreon group. This is another situation where you get ongoing support and advice. You can share your artwork in weekly voice sessions. I provide very long, nerdy, essay-like critiques. And most of all, finding that support and a small group of artists because, oh boy, our server is big. Over 11,000 people, you can get lost in the crowd. This is a way to really make friends. Thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. You are, are so amazing for hanging in there with us on this crazy journey. Visit artprof.org. There is tons of content on there that is not on YouTube. Use the search bar. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And subscribe to more tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.